So let's talk about layer three switches for just a minute. Many vendors use the term layer three switch. Notice these are contradictory terms. Layer three is routing. Switching is layer two. When you say layer three switch, you're saying layer three, layer two, which really is contradictory term. What most vendors mean is that this is a device that can be configured as a router or as a switch or possibly both at the same time. We want to caution you that while it's possible to make very complex and very difficult or very difficult to understand configurations, we would encourage you to use a layer three switch as a router. That's fine. May turn it into a router. Use a layer three switch as a switch. That's fine. Using them as both and intermixing them where these two ports are routed and those two ports are switched, all of a sudden uh, becomes very difficult because as you're standing in front of the switch trying to plug something in, you have to know the internal configuration of that switch to successfully plug things into the right place. As we think about where to put servers, in large institutions, you will have some department. Maybe it's your bursar's office or it's your admissions office and they have a server that has financial, aid, financial software or student information software and they want to put it underneath their desk because, well, it's their server and they want to see it every morning and greet it every morning and say, hello server, I'm happy to see you. This is not a proper design because that means the server is out in some random building and what do you do about good power to it? What do you about do about good air conditioning? And how do you provide reliable service to that? So the right place to put your servers are in your core location. Servers should never be on the same subnet as any user. And uh, so it needs to be a separate subnet off the core router. And again, they need to be in that same room as your core router where you have good power and good air conditioning. A typical design is simply to have an interface off your core router that goes to a switch that has your servers. The next topic is where to put firewalls. This design is a very typical design. Many, many campuses use this, including campuses at the US, all over the world. Uh, we will talk about an alternative design in a little bit, but the firewall in this position will protect all of campus from that nasty, mean outside world. And that probably works in a corporate environment to where every computer and every device on the campus network is controlled, managed, and uh, you know people don't have administrator rights, they can't install things, there's all kinds of fancy antivirus software, but campuses are not like that. People bring computers from home, students are on wireless, people have phones. So the challenge with the, this border firewall placement, as you saw in the previous diagram, is that you're not protecting users from each other. And the reality is firewalls don't protect users from getting viruses. It used to be back in the Windows XP days, that if you turned a Windows XP machine on, uh, on the internet, and uh, started to install patches on it, you would almost immediately get a virus. That's not the way viruses happen, because ever since Windows XP Service Pack 2, uh, Windows automatically comes default with its own firewall. So firewalls aren't preventing you from getting viruses. How do you get viruses on PCs? Well, People uh, are web browsing and they get a little pop-up that says, hey, we notice you have a virus. Click here to clean it. Well, if you click there, then you definitely have a virus. People also get uh, viruses by, uh, you know, they get some email and said, hey, you've uh, won $10,000. Uh, open this attachment for details and how you collect that. Well, you open that uh, attachment and guess what? Now you have a virus. Both of these activities are encrypted. You know, if, if that was a Gmail attachment, 
that is running over SSL, a firewall is not going to protect you, and thus, you know, through your firewall that you think is protecting you, you're getting no protection at all. So, you know, viruses again come with clicked links while web browsing and email attachments. Firewall isn't going to help. As your bandwidth increases, as you go from the 10 megs to 100 to uh, 1000, and heaven's sake, maybe even as many as 10 gigabit uh, external connections, firewalls have trouble scaling up to those kinds of speeds. So we want to have you think about an alternative strategy. Since the firewalls don't protect users from viruses, and if you have the border firewall placement, it can't protect users from each other. So if somebody brings a virus-infected computer in the border firewall case and plugs that computer into your network, you're in the soft inside middle of your network where there is no firewall between you and other users. There is no firewall between you and your servers where your, you know, your bursar's office, your payroll office, all the student records are. And guess what? If somebody breaks into your payroll office server, that's a bad thing. And so we want you to think about this alternative uh, firewall placement of placing the firewall between your campus network, which now is somewhat hostile. It's almost as hostile as the internet and the servers that you want to protect. So another thing you want to consider is that not all servers are created equal. So for example, some servers are dedicated to primarily student use. For example, Moodle. If you are running your own local Moodle instance, every student has an account there. Well, I personally would not put a Moodle server on the same IP subnet as my payroll and financial systems because I care about getting a paycheck. You might even want to segment your servers to where you have more public servers and more private servers. Put different classes of servers on different subnets.